I'm sorry, I keep somehow disappearing the, the Zoom screen. I apologize. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Mace and Pamela's coming. We're volunteers, as all you want, I think most of you know, um, for our amazing Wednesday night group. And here's Pamela. Hi, and I have, we're just delighted that you're here. Um, I'm going to drop some links in the chat in just a minute about offering your donations to support the Dharma Collective and to support our amazing teachers. Tonight, we are lucky to be with Lopan Chandra. Um, and then also, I have failed to do my homework to find out what's upcoming at the Dharma Collective. I believe I saw an email about the, um, I don't know even how to say it. Is it Loka Vihara nuns? I'm not quite sure how. Is that yeah. right, Sandra? Yeah. Loka? I think so. Loka means a realm or a world. A L O, whatever. Anyways. Aloka? Aloka. They're coming on, they come on once a month, I think on Saturday or Sunday. I'll put some info in the um, chat. I don't know what else is coming up because I failed to do my homework. Um, Maybe and you then, could, we could take a minute or two at the end of class. Yeah. And yeah. we're going to do this sec this announcement twice. We'll do it also at the end. And please pass this on to folks. It looks like July um, and Noam, it's important for you to hear this. So I don't know if you can hear yet, um, but it looks like July is just really seriously impacted for our wonderful teachers and they need a breather. Um, and so we're going to not, and then the, all the subtypes are also, I think basically also people are just like vaccinated and traveling so there's a lot going on Pamela and I are traveling so we're not going to have class in July and we will definitely resume in August um the community in all of July in all of July right Chandra really yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so and we are really want to make sure the community stays and we're together and we're delighted um to have everybody and then um there's some cool stuff coming up next weekend so you might want to check not this weekend, but the next weekend, the queer sangha is going to happen and the Dharma of intimacy with um, Andrea Beccioni and the queer sangha is correlating to Pride weekend. So um, we'll post the information about July, um, Wednesday nights not happening on the website. And then I'm also going to put a link in the chat. Hopefully people can give me their emails in the chat. You can email them just to me so that not everybody has the email. Um, Actually, you know what I could do? Maybe it's easier for people. I could put my email in the chat and then you can email me if you want to be on a Wednesday night Sangha list. I'm not quite sure which is. Of you hard nuns are on the 20th of June. They're on this Sunday. So Sunday, just so you know. So there's all the, I'll take, yeah, all the announcements. Does anyone have questions? Because that was a little bit jumbled and frenetic. So there's not going to be any meditation on Wednesdays? I mean, are any other teachers or, or, or no meditations at all? Yeah, so Eve and I were talking, we both are uh, traveling and busy. I'm on retreat for three weeks in July. She's also really busy. And a lot of our favorite, you know, their normal subs are busy too. And so we thought maybe the community would be okay with taking a month off and coming back in August. And um, you know, we can talk about that. We can make an effort to fill it if people really feel like well, they there, would like something in there. there but is I know that the volunteers. Yeah, there's a meditation before Claudia from five to seven thirty twice a month. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> so that's happening. And then the morning sit with the community happens every weekday. Um, and so those two things are happening on Wednesdays. Regularly. Okay. And that's Thank all you. that. I just pulled that up because yeah. we weren't prepared, but the newsletter prepared us magically. I was Thank laughing you. a moment ago because Diana said, take us with you. <laughs> I thought that was cute. For real. I wish I could. Well, yeah, Sunday we'll go to Tara Mandala together and we'll do some good retreat in nature there. Southwest Colorado, near Pagosa Springs, the deepest hot springs, geothermal hot springs in uh, the norm northern american continent they say the world but i like to be safe and say the northern american continent i don't know if the world is true in any case the hot springs are right on the river so you can do hot cold plunge it's a nice thing to do before retreat after retreat so when tara mandala starts opening up 
uh, you know, I'll, I'll make more announcements and share my uh, teaching there. But for now, I'm doing retreat in a little cabin. I think I mentioned that before that Taramandala has about five or six solitary retreat cabins, about 200 square feet. They have little kitchenettes. You got to bring, you know, we bring our own water and food, but they replenish that every week for you. And a great decks to meditate on. It's like you're, this is the sky, this beautiful Colorado summer sky. Um, this is my background. This is a view right outside of the temple. You see the Buddha statue underneath a tree. I don't know what kind of tree that is, but the leaves turn red during parts of the year. So beautiful place. And uh, we will start opening up probably spring of 2022. We're not doing a lot of public retreats. Although Mark Coleman is doing a wilderness retreat because we figured we could do that because people aren't going to be staying in the residence hall. In any case, um, I wanted to also let you know that on Saturday, June 26th, I'll do my monthly Wisdom Rising course with Nina Rao. And that's from uh, 3 to 5 p.m. Pacific time on Saturday. Usually we do it on the Sundays. But this month, we needed to do it on Saturday. And I'm very excited about this one. She's going to share some really great teachings on Durga and her various names. And then I'll tie that into Tara's. Uh, there's a lot of overlap. And we'll chant and meditate and listen to stories. Everyone's welcome to that. And even if you can't make it to the live session, if you register, and obviously it's not expensive, and, and if finances are an issue, you can always let us know. But if you sign up, you can get the recording and listen to it later. And you also get access to all the past recordings. So video on her YouTube channel. So that's that. I'm uh, excited about tonight. We have a, an interesting slogan. I think it will be uh, worth our while. Um, but before we talk more, let's take a moment now and, and drop in. Let's do about a half hour sit. So make sure you're in a comfortable position, whatever that is for you. And take a moment to listen to your body. What does the body want? What is the body saying? At the end of a long day, would you like to do supine meditation? You have full permission to do that. Or you can get nice and comfy on a cushion or a chair. If you feel that you can be upright, that's always nice. Turn off your notifications, close your door, tell your family you're meditating, don't bother you for 30 minutes. <laughs> Whatever you need to do to claim your space. And then we can start by allowing the eyes to close or just be gently hooded if that's more comfortable for you. If you're looking towards the computer, you can dim the screen so that it's not so visually stimulating. Or you can turn perpendicular and look away from the computer, which I think is great too. Before we meditate, let's do a few circles with the nose, relaxing tension from the neck. And just breathe into the belly and release tension with the out breath. The small or large circles, whatever feels good for you. If you feel any discomfort, don't push through it, but make smaller circles. And then when you're ready, switch going in the other direction. Keep the breath slowing down in the body. Relax the jaw and the face too, as well as the shoulders. Last circle. Good, coming to center, inhale to neutral. And then start to roll your shoulders a little bit just to get all that mental energy to start to Kind of loosen up and reintegrate in the body. If 
and reverse. And last one. Good. So now inhale, and as you exhale, like a sheep bowing, let out a breath and go, <laughs> kind of shake it off, shake off any tension. Inhale, even shake your arms out. <laughs> one more. Just shaking out tension and exhale. <laughs> and then inhale as you come back, finding your central axis. Feeling the breath in the body, dropping into the moment again, turning the mind inward. Arouse the heartfelt motivation for your practice. Bodhicitta, if you wish, you can take the Bodhicitta Mudra with the two fingers the middle finger straight up, the rest of the fingers folded. Single pointed intention to practice for the benefit of all beings, including ourselves. Thank you. And now releasing any control of the breath, let's take about uh, 21 breaths, just breathing in at the top of the in-breath, silently internally count one. And with the out-breath, relieving that, any tension with the out-breath, just practicing mindfulness of the breath, implementing a gentle touch of count at the top of each breath, from one to 21. Just giving that busy mind something to do. Releasing tension with the out-breath, continuing to stay in the moment, in the body, with the breath. Helping to calm the mind, calm the nervous system, aligning the mind with the breath.
And then releasing, counting when you reach 21. And feel the silk envelopment of the breath and fold every moment of awareness in the body. Valuing the capacity to stay, to stay in the moment, to calm the mind, the breath, natural flow. And valuing the important and quite simple practice of letting go. Letting go, grasping the fantasy, distraction. Let the immediate response to be release, relax, and return to the breath. Returning home to the moment. And even if and when you're fused with thoughts, captured by them, it's okay. The same response, let go. Release the grasping, fixation, the clinging, the fusion. However that feels to you, open the grasping palm of the mind. And feel that quality of release and space. Feel yourself come home to the breath. This is wisdom. This is the quality of clarity and insight. We don't have to fuse with thoughts. We have a choice. Release. Return and rest, this anchor of the breath in mindfulness, presence.
You can feel that very dynamic or quality of letting go be infused with love, metta. It's a letting go and yet it's an envelopment of awareness an opening to the warmth that is the light of your awareness that's always here. Maybe you could open to that warmth and that light a little more than you're used to. Can you open? Let that in. Bask in the glow.
Sometimes we feel like uh, with meditation, our life should be easier. But in fact, what we're doing with meditation is training the capacity to be with whatever arises, however easy or challenging. Being with what is, noticing if it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And letting our breath, letting our metta, our loving kindness of presence, awareness, suffuse whatever it is that you're experiencing. That's what we're training up in. Life might get easier, life might get harder for a while. Training in the maturity and the wisdom, capacity to be with it, to learn from it, to befriend it. An aspect of wisdom or prajna is spaciousness. Rather than being fused, captured by our thoughts and fantasies, hopes and fears, can we be with and rest more from the vantage point of a spacious quality of awareness. This is how prajna or wisdom is born within you non-conceptual, it's a feeling. Water that seed of wisdom within you.
And now for the last few minutes of our meditation, I'd love to end in a mantra recitation together to the great mother, Pragya Paramita, the perfection of wisdom mantra found at the end of the Heart Sutra, one of the earliest uh, Mahayana texts which teach on wisdom, which is the main theme of our evening. And the mantra, I've put it in the chat, Tadyata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhi Swaha. Tadyata means thus it is said. Om is the universal sound of consciousness. Gate Gate, each Gate means gone, gone, means like transcending samsara, transcending suffering. Paragate means beyond gone, like periphery, same Indo-European root. Paragate is beyond gone. Parasamgate means totally beyond gone. Para beyond, sam means totally or complete or same. Gate gone, bodhi awakened, swaha may be so. Tadyata om gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhi swaha. The Tibetans and the Bhutanese pronounce tadyata as teyata, teyata, teyata. So that's how we'll sing it, that's how I learned it. Feel free to listen for a while and then join in and enjoy the sweetness of your own voice singing. Open the heart and open to the blessings of the Great Mother. Pragya Paramita. Teyata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhi Swaha Teyata Om Gate 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 para gate para saham gate bodhiswaha te yata om gate gate para gate para saham gate bodhi Swaha te om gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhi swaha te yata om gate gate para gate Para sangate bodhi swaha te yata om gate gate para gate para sangate bodhi swaha te yata Om gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhi swaha te yata Om gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhi Swaha te yata om gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhi swaha te yata om gate gate para gate Para sam gate bodhi swaha te yata 
Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Saham Gate Bodhi Swaha Te Ata Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Saham Gate Bodhi Swaha te ahata te gate para gate para saham gate bodhi swaha Teata om gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi swaha. Thank you. do a silent dedication of merit if you wish if the energy of our meditation be of benefit spread out far and wide thank you I'm in the dark I hope you can see me well enough. I'm in a friend's laundry room (laughs) because I am traveling and the lighting is not great. Um, And I wonder if you can also hear the children outside. Is that distracting? No. Okay, good. This is hopefully is a good enough mic where it's canceling out the ambient noise a little bit or a lot. So that uh, mantra is actually said to be the very first mantra ever appearing in Buddhism. The before that mantras weren't so commonly used. This uh, arose, this is found at the very end of the Heart Sutra, as I mentioned, and I'll translate it again. Somebody asked me to do that. So, tadyata means thus it is said, or thus it was spoken. Om is the universal sound of consciousness. Like if we could hear the universe, it would be, it would sound like Om. Common way to start mantras. Gate gate is gone, gone. Paragate means beyond gone. Parasam gate means totally beyond gone. Bodhi, awaken or enlightenment. Swaha, may it be so or so be it. It's a common ending. So my joke with this one is this is a Southern California surfer dude mantra. Why? Because it's like way totally beyond gone, man. Far out. <laughs> like you're beyond concepts. Like awakened, awake, enlightenment is cannot be described. It's non-conceptual, transcending duality of subject, object. So altogether you would say, Thus it was said, Om, gone, gone, beyond gone, totally beyond gone, enlightenment, may it be so. Now, what's interesting is we don't really, you know, we don't translate mantras and then recite them in English. We just, we translate them so we can understand what they mean, but we keep them in Sanskrit. The Tibetans did that. You know, other countries tried to do that, you know, I mean, sometimes when you hear the mantras from Japan or Tibet or China, yeah, it sounds a little different than the original Sanskrit, but there's still the Shakti there, (laughs) you know, centuries of devoted recitation carries a lot. 
Yeah, gone to the other shore is another way. Para, para gate means like gone way completely beyond. And it's true that gone to the other shore is a way of describing enlightenment. We've kind of transcended or traversed the ocean of samsara. You know, tathagata garva is the word for Buddha nature, but literally it means the thus gone seed or the thus gone one like the a synonym for the buddha is tathagata maybe you've heard that the tathagata thus once said tathagata and that means the thus gone one and so definitely this is a common metaphor so yes it's not like we're getting out of here so that you know we can escape it's more about describing the state of enlightenment as um, transcendent yet including all of our experience beyond concept so that is wisdom that is wisdom wisdom why because in buddhism maybe you've noticed this that when we say wisdom it really it means a specific thing it's not kind of a broad term that refers to the wise old people wisdom in buddhism refers to that intuitive authentic direct experience that knowing of the way things are the suchness the dharmata the way things exist in their deepest most essential nature which is shunyata, interdependent, empty fullness. It's not stark and empty. It's juicy and full of vibrancy and potentiality. Shunyata. Are you hearing my, my son yelling? <laughs> hold on, hold on. Let me go ask for some respect here. Hold on a sec. Ramit, that's what full vibrancy does sound like. <laughs> Twelve and a half year old vibrancy. Hormones pumping through his veins. <laughs> Especially when there's some cute teenagers around. So it's hard to uh, tame that. Thanks for your patience, everybody. <laughs> I don't want to tame it, but you know, I need to ask him to turn it down a little bit. So, so that's pragya or pragya paramita, the gone to the other shore of wisdom, actually. Paramita, para also means perfected, right? We say the six perfections or the perfections of wisdom. This is the word paramita. The para means beyond, right? It's in paragate. It's that thus gone, the gone to the other shore, transcended. So, any questions, comments, observations before we dive into slogan number 44, which is a continuation of this theme of uh, wisdom in a very interesting way. I'll try to get some more light. Can chat in. Yeah, well, the terror of 12. Tell me about it. Kind of like the calm before the storm, sort of. The storm is forming right now. And the 13, 14, the whole teenage years is a little bit more terror <laughs> invoking to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's jump in. Lots of material to reflect. Yeah, the 44th slogan. Okay. 
So, slogan number 44, train in the three difficulties. Train in the three difficulties. What does that mean? What's so difficult? Well, life is difficult. Of course, samsara is difficult. And as we all know, Lo Jong is about befriending adversity, learning from adversity, developing wisdom, patience, compassion in the face of the joys and the sorrows, right? Lo Jong also, mind training, is also about uncovering our inherent goodness, you know, primordial goodness within all of us. It's also a way of cultivating loving kindness, compassion. So being able to be with the challenges, the adversity, but also highlighting and enjoying and celebrating the gifts, right? The gifts and the challenges. Lo Jong is like the whole spectrum. We're training up in, in um, agility with all of life all that life throws at us. So this particular slogan, train in the three difficulties, is about facing difficulties, right? How do we do that? So the first of the three is the difficulty that obstacles arise so quickly in us so quickly that it's hard to catch them. So this is kind of talking about a very personal level of difficulties, right? So anger arises very quickly and then we're already enveloped by it. Jealousy, fear, competitiveness, jealousy, uh, insecurity. All of these kind of real simple human universal emotions. This first difficulty is pointing to the challenge that these kind of obstacles to our happiness, right? The blocks to our happiness or the, the, the kind of like uh, the, the side routes that we take instead of going towards happiness, we kind of get enamored by things and we get pulled in different directions. These things happen quickly, like you're on a, uh, trying to follow your map and before you know it, you're veering into the wrong way, you're veering off in the wrong direction. And then later, you know, a moment you're like, wait a minute, I didn't mean to do that, but you're there. And then you've got to be with where you are. So sometimes it's hard to slow down enough to recognize this first instant where we get pulled off our route, where we get pulled into reactivity or neuroses, strong emotions pull us. And so in, in Buddhism, whether it's early like Theravada approach or Mahayana Vajrayana, they all say that this capacity to notice has the quality of wisdom. That's why the theme is so strong tonight. It's like when we can rest in the when we can develop a certain capacity of mindfulness, introspection, in a sense, kind of slow our reactivity down and see the momentary change of things, become fascinated with these things arising. How do they, where do they come from? Where does anger come from? Where does it abide? And then where does it go? This is cultivating wisdom. Pragya, P-R-A-J-N-A. And so when we can't do that, what Dharma says is that means there's not enough wisdom present. Cultivate more of that capacity. So, of course, the traditional commentary is that these obstacles are defined as these five kind of stem kleshas, you could say, of aversion, attachment, ignorance, jealousy, and arrogant pride. These are like they've called these five poisons. But of course, a myriad of different versions of these fan out in many directions. 
and often we don't see when we've been captured by these. It's too late. We're already overwhelmed. So this first training is to try to be a little quicker to notice. See if we can notice them as they arise. So this is what we were doing in the meditation of kind of building awareness, building the capacity to calm the mind, slow it down. Because we all know through experience, we don't have the power or the capacity to control external stimuli. We don't have control over how fast things arise also within us. Like that's just going to happen. But we can develop the capacity to control our reactivity around it. We can develop the capacity around how slow we respond. So things arise quickly, but we don't have to, we can slow it down and respond with more presence. How? Dropping into the breath, right? Developing our breath awareness, our mindfulness slowing down our reactivity. Because we all know that we'll do what we're conditioned to do, right? If we're conditioned through our upbringing and our culture and media and our influences to be speedy, to be reactive, to be fiery, to be impatient, then we'll do that with ourselves and these kleshas coming up. So if we're used to being distracted when challenges come up, like I'm angry, ugh, okay, drink a beer, (laughs) or yell, or, you know, that's what we'll do. We tend to pop off of these feelings. We don't want to be with them. So meditation helps us learn to slow down and be with them. Then we train that. We condition our mind in that way. We develop those neuronal connections. We can craft these new pathways and slow down, calm ourselves. And then the second difficulty, right? Remember it says train in the three difficulties. So the second difficulty is just acknowledging that often things have already arisen and we're caught up in them. They've moved so quickly in us. We haven't quite developed the capacity to recognize them and release them. This kind of natural liberation. We haven't quite developed that. So things move in on us. It's really hard to know what to do then, right? So what do we do when we're completely enveloped in the emotion, in the klesha? In Tibetan, the word for klesha is nyonmong. Nyonmong, afflictive emotions, encumbered patterns. What do we do when we're in it? When we're like we've already fallen in the ocean. They're really hard to overcome. Sometimes we have to ride out the arc of the adrenaline, the hormonal release, the rush of it. Sometimes we need to walk things off. Sometimes we need to lie down and cry. <laughs> So the second training is to kind of start to f- train more up and like, okay, once they're in, they, once they've kind of captured us, they have us by the jugular, what do we do then? Okay, we look for the root. We look for the root. What is the root of the emotion? What is the root of suffering? The Buddha taught that it's our clinging, it's our fixation on this illusory sense of self. I and mine, then the whole spin out of confusion happens. So I'm angry because I'm like, I need to justify myself. You hurt my feelings, you know? And sometimes it's important to stand up for yourself and to speak your truth. But can we do it from an empowered place rather than a completely tortured, consumed place? That's the, that's the question. Another way of looking at this is once we've been captured, 
We once we've been taken hostage. It's, you know, in Buddhism, we talk about the sense doors, right? So you have the sense doors of the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the ears, the touch sense door of, of tactile sensation. And in Buddhism, we talk about the sixth sense door, which is the mind. And what happens when we're captured is that the sense door of the mind starts to quiver, starts to shake. It wants to be anywhere but in that feeling. So mindfulness, breathing, letting go, all those things we were doing in the meditation helps us to bring calm to that quivering, shaking sense door of the mind. Because we need to calm it before we can get to the root. When the mind is calm, then the agitation calms. And then you can have more clarity of the root. What's what's happening here? What's really happening? Oh, underneath the anger is hurt. A feeling of being abandoned or left alone to fend for ourselves. Or a sadness, a heartbreak. Okay, so what's underneath that? So as the mind, the sense door of the mind becomes more and more calm, then we develop that capacity to drop. And in a sense, it's like mining for the gold. And... This is what trains us in being more capacitated with anything that comes our way. That's why I said, you know, in the meditation, we assume our life's going to get easier. We should be, you know, things should be easier the more we meditate. But really, it's not that way. What we're doing is we're developing the capacity to be with the suffering of ourself, our loved ones, the world. So then the third difficulty is that the kleshas keep coming back, right? So it's not like you're going to go to the root and never see that one again. They might be recurring because they're a part of you. So this third difficulty is just naming that these kleshas, these afflictive emotions, have a cyclical nature. That It's really hard to cut them once and for all. Now, of course, the Buddha taught that the root of all suffering is self-clinging, is ego fixation, is that clinging to the illusory sense of of I. So the metaphor is that if you can cut that at the root, then the other kleshas won't have sway over you, won't be so strong. Maybe they'll arise that the ego is not fixating and identifying onto them, and therefore the suffering doesn't ensue. You might experience it, but the suffering isn't capturing you. So this third training, this third train and the third difficulty means to stop kind of falling for the klesha. Stop falling for it again and again. Another way of looking at it is stop being attached to them. Because in a way, these kleshas make up our ego, our sense of self. And who would we be without them? So again, they come back, they keep coming back until you have the pragya, the wisdom, that deep understanding. And really that is synonymous with healing. Wisdom, the cultivation of insight and understanding, mindfulness, Compassion, all of these are healing medicines. So the first step is to condition yourself to stay rather than go. Calm rather than shake and bounce off. So 
So whatever degree of intensity that arises within your body, even trauma, you know, because in meditation, traumatic memories can arise. Often it can actually incite them. What do we do with that? But through practice, we can, you know, of course, there's a lot of things. We can open the eyes, we can tap, we can take a walk if we're really in it. That's a whole other level with trauma. But over time, we can also train in the recognition, which I'm sure a lot of you are already doing, like that's no longer happening anymore. Yes, I can feel the response, the memory of it incites panic, incites feelings. But there's also a secondary awareness that knows that that's not happening in this moment. That happened in the past. That is wisdom. That is wisdom. And that wisdom has the capacity to heal. We can bear witness to things without fusing onto them. We don't fly away, but we're training ourselves to stay and birth those aspects of ourselves. So that is my commentary to the three training in the three difficulties. It's really teaching us how to turn towards and to acknowledge, okay, what can you cut it right away? If not, what do you do once you're in it? Okay, maybe you get a little success there, maybe not. What do you do when you're recognizing the same thing comes back over and over again? I'd love to hear from you. really anything that comes up around that. I'm very humble in the face of this one. This is hard. This is, um, I think with time, we, we develop this quality of more capacity. Um, but then we get, we also get humbled from time to time, like life slaps us down. <laughs> I see Um, Diane has raised her hand and then Jason. Yeah. Well, thank you for this. It's so relevant. And that seems to be my major practice, these um, seizures of the kleshas. And, (laughs) and I went to a teaching and the teacher was talking about how the, the, in Mahayana Buddhism, there's that, or in Buddhism, the storehouse consciousness that we have all these seeds that we're just you know, yeah. we're these confluence, we're five aggregates, but each is like a buck, like an ocean of different things that all come together. So yeah. we have those and they come up and they come up. And um, Eve Ekman last week get a, gave a teaching as part of a conference and she referred to uh, Professor Paul Gilbert. So I watched his, um, he has a long talk on YouTube, but he's, you know, we can't help it. We're, we're built this way. You know, we have like an old brain and then a newer part of our brain. Yes. And so, you know, it's so this fight, flight, or freeze, that's just, you know, that's the um, sympathetic, you know, so that just, these things come up and all of a sudden, like, that's my default. If I see someone, instead of like smiling, like the Dalai Lama, sometimes I'm like, what the fuck do they want, you know? And that's, you know, so the Lojong helps to train with that, but, um, you know, untrain all that, but we've got the parasympathetic, which, which our Mahayana training can, um, give us tools so that we can, you know, notice the kleshas, the, you know, the discursive thinking, because, you know, and then that it's all because, you know, we're confused about who we are. And then once the confusion goes away, and His Holiness, the Dalai Lama in the teaching was saying, and if you can, if you can get the confused, understand the ignorance, the other, the other poisons will dissipate, you know, so that just seems like the work, the work of it. And I just think of another teacher talking about once these, these seeds come up, but then they get, weak. well, hopefully, <laughs> they get weaker you know they keep coming up and coming up but I like the idea of just there's a there's a path there's a solution and um, we can be relieved of this just so that we're not harming and we're we're just in more of a flow of of kindness and goodness and linked to all the goodness so anyway so thank you so much for this teaching mm, thank you Diane thank you Jason uh 
Thank you so much for the uh, clarity about the first um, step of this, which is is sort of when you're not quick enough. This idea that there's um, a moment where anger or or I tend to think of it as my righteousness because I have a I have a quality that will respond when I feel injustice. And it's either personal or towards others, but it's it's a sense of like this isn't right, something's happening. And my first reaction is to just fuse with it and to engage. And I, I'm really seeing like now that I'm much more clear about like, oh, that's happening. I can see that it's happening, but I can't stop myself from responding. So I'm wondering if there is like, you know, a mantra or a word or a a kind of an almost an intervention, you know. I feel like I need that just to practice this because I'm so customarily responsive. I'll be responsive and angry and in it. And I even know I'm doing it and I need to actually trigger a different reaction. Do you have any suggestions? About mm. I wanna bring you to your body, you know, like you know what it feels like when you get in that mindset, that triggered mm. space. So you've got to be like a, a hound dog, you know, smell it right away. Mm. Feel that. Oh, that's that again. And then, so you recognize it, not a head thing, but a body thing, like, oh, that feeling again. And then drop into your feet. Mm -hmm. Feel your feet on the earth. Take a breath. Breathe the breath into the earth. That's your mantra. And then pause. You're going to react differently. You might still have the juice of the passion there. That's not bad. It's just channeling it so that you can you know, respond or speak in a way that is even more beneficial because you're connected to the earth. People, people respond to you when you have that. People feel it, it's healing. So this is one of my personal lessons is listen to my body. Like what is my body telling me? I have overrode it. We override. We're not taught to listen to our body. We, we're taught to not trust our body, but how many times have you had a gut feeling about something? And but then you overrode it with your freaking intellect, right? <laughs> so what is your body telling you in those moments? Oh, and then breathe with it. Oh, I'm angry. Oh, I'm Jason, I'm so angry. You know, what's interesting too is uh, mm -hmm. a lot of this is associated with re-entry where yeah. my, my response to re-entering is, is overwhelmed. It's just yeah. too much. I can't, I need to shut down or pull away. And that's when my body is telling me, or I, I know that point where I'm actually really vulnerable, like I'll react and I'll trigger if I don't take a, take a moment and really recover. So I'm dealing with a lot of re-entry right now. And it feels like that's just a common theme, probably for everyone. Like how do you re-enter after you've trained yourself to, to move away from people on the street, to, to, to shut down? Now I feel like I need to open up and enjoy it, but I'm just overwhelmed, you know? So that's kind of where this is coming from, I think. Yeah. Thank you for naming that. It is overwhelming. It's hard. It's definitely something we're all going through together. It's good to take your time with that and name it, speak it, and let yourself be okay with that. Listen to your body, listen to your body. What is your gut telling you? That's my mantra. Okay, Jason, that's your mantra. What does my gut say? <laughs> the enteric nervous system picks up on way more than we know it does and often before our brain does. We have more neurons in the enteric nervous system and in, in the brain. Um, what is, yeah, maybe everybody could chat in what their gut's saying right now. <laughs> Yeah, some Genevieve says my gut is saying I'm sad about my relationships. Yeah, that's good. 
And let this breathe into the sadness, let that feeling be there. Sometimes we need to cry, sometimes we need to have more space around the simple truths that are there, you know. Thank you, Jason, that's great. Thank you for your sharing, for your vulnerability. The Dharma practice is really about vulnerability, isn't it? Like learning to be vulnerable, but then like through that, there's a kind of a humor and a humanity. um, That's very sweet and it's a gift for all of us when we can have the courage to bring that forward a bit. Speediness is a part of this practice here. Like, oh, I'm rushing to say something because I feel like, oh, in my family, you know, maybe I felt like I was cut off a lot or didn't have the space to speak my truth. Okay, so that's wisdom. I know thyself. Okay, I don't, I'm not getting cut off anymore. I'm not even with my family, so why am I rushing? (laughs) No. Slow it down. Find your own rhythm. Well, sometimes personally observing injustice does need to be responded to head on and not intellectualized. Absolutely, absolutely. not be kind of explained away or theorized but yeah and that's the gut can help us with that don't you think well sometimes it's just a no you know there's a no there but the mind is trained to go oh it's okay or or i don't know what to say so i won't say anything i i feel the gut you know i'm not saying the gut's always right but we need to learn how to listen to it. Maybe we just say, no, enough. That's not okay. Head on. Let's feel the space here. This is Dharma. It's very pregnant. You probably have a lot of different feelings coming up right now. Just breathe with that. Breathe into into the belly. Remember last week we did the meditation of the three centers. The belly is imbued with presence. The heart is imbued with a sense of openness. The head is imbued with a quality of wakefulness. When all those three centers are really online with the central axis, the central channel, those kind of intrinsically, uh, uh, those qualities that are intrinsic to our Buddha nature start to shine through. And if the belly is cut off and isn't inhabited, then the higher two centers are really just going to be like uh, depleted of oxygen, you know. They're not connected to the wellspring of the source, you know, the well of being, the belly. How does it feel to just breathe with that and feel yourself come home? Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking more about like the three, the three um, difficulties. Mm-hmm. And then I'm thinking about how, you know, I don't know how long I've been practicing Chandra, but you do, or w- whatever, it's been with you from the very beginning. But like how somehow I'm just now realizing that there's this tremendous misunderstanding for me in the practice or maybe a better way to put it is that I'm able, my ego can co-opt the practice 
into the clay shots. Like I can use the practice as another way to beat the shit out of myself. Yeah. So the not good enough mantra uses practice, right? Like I, my brain is too scattered. I'm not, I don't meditate for enough time. I'm not like something comes up in practice. And then I have a teacher who says, um, I love it. It says like, oh, I technicify, right? So <laughs> I have something uncomfortable come up in practice and then I start throwing Dharma techniques or meditation techniques at the discomfort. Like maybe I'm just agitated. And so I'm like, okay, ground or okay, orient or okay, name it or okay, you know, whatever. So I go through my little Rolodex of techniques. And then when that doesn't do it, then it's just like another, so I'm just now like, oh, like the whole, every, my ego, my not enough mantra can actually co-opt anything. It doesn't matter how yeah. wholesome the thing is on the, objectively, it can take anything and use it as part of its evidence for being a useful mantra. So I just thought I would just throw that in there. And it's, it's like, oh, I'm glad after all these years, I'm finally like understanding that. That's beautiful. Uh, that's but it's really wisdom. hard because, I mean, maybe that's been taught all along and I just couldn't hear it or understand it. doesn't matter. It. Yeah. It's, uh, that happens with all of us. You know, we won't hear it until we're ready to hear it, you know, and then we're like, wait, <laughs> that's been said. That's okay. It's common. So what you're having right now is this flash of insight, like lightning in the dark, dark timuk in Tibetan is ignorance. It's, it's, it's marig, but it's also timuk is like the density of the clouds. So you're having this flash of lightning and that's fabulous. This is yours, you know, you've earned this. So you won't forget it, right? and no one can argue this away like you know they can't take it away from you this is the kind of insight we we we, we look for right so i'm glad you shared that and it's so true that any old spiritual practice can completely reinforce your neuroses your habit patterns and it's so good that you're seeing how that's true for you. You know, I saw it all the time in the yoga world when I taught it, you know, the perfectionists coming to the mat. <laughs> oh, yoga is just a perfect vehicle for your perfectionism. <laughs> or same with Dharma, you know, all these antidotes, perfect for the fix it mind or the not good enough mind who always needs to cover up or fix up or get the antidote for something. The not good enough. Oh, Dharma is great for that. Oh, yeah. And you come to meditation and like you're stuck in this mindset where like you're not good enough and you're fucking up even in meditation. Like, <laughs> like that's not fun. So what we have to do is just like, like once we taste like, oh, that's what I'm doing. And I have, I'm so sick of suffering. You know, we have to get sick of ourselves. How many people have gotten sick of yourself? You gotten sick of yourself yet? <laughs> sick of your suffering, no, no, I'm just done. And then we can say the, the Maha Mantra. Are you ready for it? So I'm going to impart the great mantra, the innermost secret teaching. Fuck that shit. Swaha. <laughs> you've, made, you've heard me say this before. <laughs> Fuck that shit, Swaha. You know, sometimes we need to coddle and love our kleshas, but sometimes we need to turn around and look at them and say, Fuck that shit. I'm not doing that anymore. Ajahn Chah says, Throw it in the garbage heap. <laughs> I just, I don't know what it is about that image that I just love. Toss it in the garbage heap. Sounds like a lot of fun. So fuck that shit, Swaha. You could say Teyata, 
um, fuck that shit, slow. And I might be offending some of you, and I apologize for that, but sometimes explicatives go right to the heart, and nothing is too sacred in the well of being. <laughs> right? so we want to get real here. And so, absolutely, you've uncovered a very big blind spot. That's beautiful, and you are not the only one. So, so guard that with your life. You know, no, that no technique, no book, no teaching, no should, 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 is going to get in the way of me and my dharma. My dharma. It's the greatest love affair of your whole life, apart apart from Pamela, of course. <laughs> but. Pamela is Dharma. <laughs> we all know that. In any case, guard it with your life, your love affair with your Dharma, because it's you, it's your Buddha nature you're, you're uncovering and you're falling in love with. No one should take that away from you. Don't let anyone take that away from you. Like I've had fallouts with my gurus, you know, I was harassed sexually by my first lama. I almost let him take dharma away from me. You see what I mean? And I realized, hell no. He can't, he doesn't own it. He is not taking dharma away from me. I had to go get a better teacher. But even the best teachers will screw with you, you know, they'll, they'll confuse you, they'll mess with you. It's all a form of breaking down the ego, crazy wisdom. I'm not saying all of that's okay, I'm just saying it happens a lot. Sometimes it's good medicine, sometimes it's not the right medicine. It's hard to know, it's not an easy path. But never let anyone, even the Buddha or your guru, get in the way of you and your dharma. This is called hair on fire, you know, like if your hair is on fire, you don't think, oh, maybe I'll go to this corner store and get some cigarettes. Like you've like, where is the lake? You know, give me the pool of water like now, you know, that's the way we should approach our Dharma practices. Like my hair is on fire. Only Dharma can put that out. If you haven't been able to go on retreat in some way, in some way, we all have different access, different capacities, different life challenges and obligations. It's not, there's no one perfect way, but if you can like unplug and put your, all these wonderful teachings you've absorbed into practice, like you and your mat, you and your cushion, you and the sky, you and the trees, then, you know, you find the guru within you. And this. then when you spell guru, you understand the real meaning. Gee, you are you. <laughs> so, you know, try to go get alone. It doesn't have to be a fancy place. It can be a little tent in a campground. Or it can be a friend's cabin in the woods. It can be a beach house that a friend has. Whatever. Just get away. Get away. Find your rhythm. It's not going to look like mine. It's not going to look like Jason's. It's not going to look like Eve's. It's not going to be the Buddha's. It's going to be you. Because, you know, we can learn and learn and read and read and study with this teacher, that teacher, this teacher, that teacher, read those books, blah, 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 but we have to have the practice teachings come alive within us. Is the practice coming alive within you? You know, I know people in this Sangha have faced illness and death. We've had immense challenges. Where is your practice there? That's what sharpens our commitment and our our own wisdom. First teaching job I ever had with Dharma was teaching to the cancer cancer center of Santa Barbara. 
I offered free Dharma classes, never had taught before. I learned more from them than they learned from me. You know, death is the greatest teacher, honestly, you know, facing our own, but also experiencing. Some of us have experienced that with the pandemic or other issues. That's when these teachings really show their true power. And it gets out of the head and into the gut. You know, be that kind of bodhisattva. And don't let anyone take that away from you. Even your own neuroses, you know, even your own habitual patterns. That's what I'm saying to Mace. You've seen, it's like that moment the Buddha saw Mara on the path. Mara, I see you. You see that tendency? Don't let it co-opt you again and again and again. It might co-opt you, but then come back. I'm not doing that anymore. Because it's getting in the way of me and my dharma. <laughs> like Pema Chodron said in her book title, no time to lose. Well, There's another book that I don't know if it's Diane reminded me of uh, called Why Buddhism is True. It talks a lot about this, this kind of, he's, uh, it was written by Robert Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, Why Buddhism is True. If you're interested more in that, you haven't read that book, I highly recommend it. It talks about, he's an evolutionary biologist who went to like a ten, maybe a 10 day Vipassana retreat and got his mind cracked open and started doing more research and practice and retreat and study and he wrote a fabulous book called why buddhism is true and he talks about that like we have our biology but really what the buddha taught in terms of um, mindfulness and non-grasping it kind of interrupts the chain of causation from the reptilian brain to the prefrontal cortex is kind of capacity to be aware and then to actually create new neuronal pathways like we can do that so there's so much good i'm not a big neuroscience person i love it but it's not like what i'm strong with you know maybe eve's got more of that under her belt but i do like reading about it and i do like anything that supports what i already know (laughs) about dharma because I already know that's true. And why not bring science along for the ride? You know, obviously, maybe science, like the Dalai Lama says, sometimes science will actually disprove some of the things Buddhism says, like especially about cosmology. Like it's kind of not really accurate. Buddhist cosmology is more metaphoric. Um, but Buddhists were more of the psychonauts, the internal adventurers, not the external astronauts so we've mapped that world pretty well and so a lot of this neuroscience people like robert wright and other wonderful um you know uh richie davidson of course we have a lot of really great buddhist neuroscience research out there to draw on it's just amazing but if it if science disproves what some of the things that buddhism says his holiness the dalai lama says he will accept that very interesting. Okay, everybody. So there's ways to stay connected here in the chat. Upcoming events from SF Dharma Collective, our wonderful home. And uh, perhaps uh, it might be Eve next week. It might be me. We'll see what happens. And then I'll be gone for July. We're probably going to go quiet for July. So you can put your own practice. Uh, see how you're doing. Feel your own pulse. Doesn't mean you shouldn't practice, you know. Come to community in other ways, but also maybe sit. Sit with yourself. I know I'll be sitting with myself. <laughs> and a part of me is scared, you know, just admit it, you know. Three weeks, solitary retreat. I haven't done this for a while. I've got kids, you know. I don't have that freedom. But now he's 12. 
doesn't even want to be around me anymore. My oldest is 21. I mean, he wants to be around me. He does. A little bit. Claudia says on July 6th, the movie called Evolution of the Heart will be released by the Mind and Life Institute to celebrate the Dalai Lama's birthday. That's right. July 6th is his birthday. And email me directly if you want to be on our email list. It's probably something we should have been doing a couple years ago, but like capturing your email so that if something comes up or we have news, we can communicate with you directly. So Mason, maybe Noam will start working on that a little bit, maybe how we can have a bit more directed communication if we have to, might be worth it. But the idea is that we're gonna go quiet for July, come back in August full force. Yeah, maybe um, people could self-organize the meetings in the park. Absolutely, peer practice, so good. So I'll let you guys um, figure that out and hope it, hope it happens. Thank you everyone, be well. Dedicate and celebrate. Enjoy your week. Do you too. Be gentle as we all start to open up more.